sorry. I did not loop that around. He's fine. He's fine. <laughs> I talked to him last night. We, we always say we don't make athletes, we make nerds, my husband and I, our children. So he is right now, I just want you to picture this in your mind just for a morning laugh. He is at a Pokemon Regional Championship. <laughs> yes. With my 18-year-old son and my 16-year-old daughter, and they all have Pokemon clothes on. <laughs> and Michael, my 49-year-old husband, who is in fact the assistant coordinator for RUF, okay? He has a Pokemon. It is bright orange. He's got all his cards in it and his gear. I mean, this man is like freaked out. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> but he's fine. He's fine. All right, this morning, let's continue some of Jesus' last words to his disciples. And we're going to move on to chapter 16 and talk about what does it look like to trust Jesus in the middle of difficulty, when things get hard. Or even when we start to be anxious about what we think might be hard. We haven't even seen it yet, but we've started to live in that place of anxiety of what might come. What then? Well, he had words for us about that as well. This is John 16. We're going to read the first 15 verses. <clears throat> Verse 1, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father, nor me. But I've said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me where you're going but because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. <clears throat> I think last night I may have told you that my youngest son, Ezra, is adopted. I don't remember if I told you that. He's 13. He is the son of a 14-year-old. She was 14. Birth mom was 14 at the time. Didn't know she was pregnant. He was born 11 weeks early. He was 3 pounds. And now he's 13 and he's 180 pounds. So he's doing fine. <laughs> he's doing okay. He's my height and 180 pounds. He could take me, is what I tell him. <laughs> but when we were going through the process of adoption, we had a caseworker named Christy. And in the state of Georgia at the time, it was a little bit complicated to adopt. There were all these things happening in the legislature, and that's where we lived at the time. He was born in Macon, Georgia. But the thing that I remember the most Christy telling us in that whole process is all the things that could go wrong. Over and over, she told us all the things that could go wrong. Birth mom could change your mind. Birth father could show up and refuse to terminate rights. Baby could have all kind of medical complications. You could have a really kind of hard, hard relationship with birth family if they chose to be a part of his life. Now, why would she tell us all the things that could go wrong? when we were just trying to give a baby a home? Well, because she knew that something was gonna go wrong. She knew it was gonna be hard because she'd been through this lots of times as a caseworker, and she didn't want us to be discouraged when it came. She didn't, want it, she didn't want us to give up and walk away. And so she gave us all these warnings of what was coming. 
we are prone to worry about all the things that are coming. And we may trust God for our ultimate salvation, but we don't always know how to trust Jesus with tomorrow's medical test or next year's graduation. The disciples also knew what it was like to worry about the future. And they, they knew what it was like to know Jesus but fear what he would do next. And Jesus knew that. And like our caseworker, he warned his disciples and he warns us of what's coming. He warns them of trouble that's coming. So if you're ever anxious, maybe in the middle of the night, or as you walk through your house, or as you do your dishes. This passage is for you. Jesus speaks plainly about the disciples' future. And here's what we're going to find in this passage that we can hold on to, is because Jesus knows our future, we can trust him with what's coming. Because he knows our future, we can trust him with what's coming, whatever it is. So what's coming? Well, he tells us three things in this passage. Yes, trouble. Trouble's coming. But also help is coming. And glory is coming. Trouble, help, and glory. Those are the th these three things we're going to see. So let's start with verse 1. First, trouble is in fact coming. He says, I've said all these things to keep you from falling away. Jesus knows that there's trouble coming. And he knows that there is an actual possibility that these disciples could fall away, could walk away. And the, the word used here is scandalizo. It's the same from the root word of scandal. He's afraid that there is, he may be a snare or offensive to them. He, he doesn't want them to stumble over him or his words when he leaves. And he knows that the greatest danger they face is actually that it's apostasy, which is saying a lot when you realize what else he predicts for them. Verse 2, they'll put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you think, will think he's offering service to God. What's he talking about? So the, the synagogue, as you know, was a place of worship for the Jews. And in their time and in their culture, the Romans had given them jurisdiction over their own people. And so they could put some Jews out of their local synagogue. And they could do worse than that. And when they do it, Jesus says, they're going to think that they're performing an act of worship. Why is that? Verse 3, they do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. They would think that they were defending the faith by actually persecuting Jesus' people. That they were protecting the true God. And Jesus wants them to remember his words and not be surprised when it happens. So he says, verse 4, I have said these things to you that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Well, we live 2,000 years post-Jesus. Did these things happen? Yeah, they certainly did. In Acts 7, we read about the first Christian martyr, Stephen. Paul experienced this service to God, he says, when they stoned him multiple times, he received the 39 lashes by the Jews. Jesus warned that trouble would come, and trouble did come. But isn't it interesting that he tells them why he warns them? He says in verse 1, to keep you from falling away. Not to keep you from avoiding persecution. Not to make it so that it will be easy for you. Not even to avoid death. But to keep you from falling away. See, the greatest danger for them and for us is not hard things in our life. And it's not pain. It's not even death. It's walking away from Jesus. That's the most dangerous thing for us. And he warned them, and he does the same with us. He warned us ahead of time. These warnings are given in lots of places, right? Here, here's kind of a funny one to think about. You know when you go to the doctor and something painful is coming? You know they're going to give you a shot or whatever, and so they give you this kind of warning. Here's my favorite one. This is a room full of women, mostly. Sorry. 
When you go for a mammogram, if you have not done this, it's coming, okay? And this woman takes you into a room, and she says, this might be uncomfortable. And if you've done it before, you're like, whatever, lady. You're going to take my left boob and make it a pancake. That's what's about to happen. But I digress. Why does she do this? Why the warning? Well, at the most fundamental level, it's so that you do not try to dislodge yourself from this machine <laughs> and run out the door, right? This is a, it's a warning at a basic level. It's a warning of love, because she knows what's coming. And so she wants to keep you there, and she wants you to know, I know that this hurts. What about us? What trouble is coming? We're probably not going to be put out of the synagogue, but Jesus wants us to know, this is going to hurt, and it's okay because I know. I know what's coming. And he gives us warnings. John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that then me, you may have peace. In this world, you'll have trouble. John 15, 20 says, remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. Matthew 10, 38 says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. He basically says, if you want to follow me, you're following the call to come and die. What is it in your life right now? What's the difficulty? What's the hard thing? Or what's the anxiety that you can't stop? Jesus knows about it. He knows who will mistreat you because of your love for him, but he also knows the phone call that's coming, or the accident, or the diagnosis, or the failed marriage, or the hurting child, or the wayward child. He tells us our future. He tells us in our future trouble is coming so we might trust him with that future. What, is it, what does it look like practically on the ground, that word trust? It's ethereal, right? What, what's trusting? It means we take those specific anxieties that when you wake up at 2 or 3 in the morning, I don't know, why is it always 2 or 3? For me, it's always 2 or 3. <laughs> those things that are just spinning in your head and you catch them, and you give them to Jesus. You name them to him, each one, as many times as you need to. What is that for you right now? For me, it's my 16-year-old daughter, Elsie. She has Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. If you've heard, it's a connective tissue disease, so she's real bendy. She's more stretchy than she should be. And what it means is that she has a lot of pain all the time. And she uses a crutch, sometimes a wheelchair, if she's having a real painful day. She's 16 years old. She's had to leave her regular high school because she can't get around it. It's too big, even with a wheelchair, and kids are mean, so they make fun of her. And she's in an alternate program. This is where my anxiety is now. These are the things that I, in the middle of the night, have to say over and over to Jesus. I'm trusting you. Please help her. Please help with her future. I worry she'll stop getting out of bed because it's too painful. I worry she won't graduate from high school. But Jesus doesn't promise me that her pain is going to end. He doesn't promise me she's going to finish high school or that it's ever going to get better. You know what he promises? I'm going to be with you. He promises, I know her trouble. I've told you there will be trouble here. Why? So that my faith is strengthened and I am reassured to know that what is happening to her and to me and to all of you is not outside of his knowledge it's not an accident that his sovereignty is actually that big. So we entrust ourselves and all of our daughters and all of our sons and all of our moms to the sovereign control of God. Is that what you do with your anxiety? Do you name it and give it to him? Ask the Spirit to help you that instead of staying in the vortex of anxiety, that he would help you to grab it and name it to Jesus, each one of the things. He is eager to hear you. 
But trouble isn't the only thing that's coming, Jesus tells his disciples. He also says, help is coming. There's good news. (laughs) Help is coming. Look at verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Who's the helper? Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. It's literally his name. Isn't that great? One of his names, Helper. At the end of verse 4, Jesus says, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. See, they've been with Jesus for three years, and it's been crazy, and they've seen some things. But they've had him with them all the time. And he's been that security. But now he's saying, I'm going to leave. And they're anxious. His presence had been enough. So he reassures them in verse 7, it is to your advantage that I go away. How is that true? How is it an advantage to them and to us that Jesus left? Wasn't it better to have him in person? God has ordained that his saving reign would not be fully inaugurated until Jesus had died, risen from the dead, be exalted to his Father's right hand, and return to the glory he had before the incarnation. The Spirit could not be sent until all those events had transpired. And when he walked the earth, he could only be in one place at one time, having dinner with a bunch of sinners or talking to the Pharisees. But the Holy Spirit represents Jesus dynamically to the whole world, everywhere. He is moving and working and inspiring and convicting and encouraging right now in Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and everywhere else. They could not have a concept of what that meant yet. But it was very good news that the Spirit was coming. So what's this help that the Spirit's going to give? Well, he, he lists it out for us. Jesus tells us lots of help that he's going to give. And it depends on who he's helping. He gives two categories. Help to unbelievers and help to believers. Look at verse 8. And when he comes, he will convict or convince the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. This is actually the work that the Spirit performs in the world for unbelievers. He convicts. He acts as both judge and prosecuting attorney at once. He convicts. See, the world thinks that we as believers are on trial, but it's actually the world that's on trial. That's what the Holy Spirit does, especially now. But it's the world on trial. And Jesus names three specific areas of conviction. And he breaks them down for us. Verse 9, concerning sin, because they don't believe in me. Sin, missing the mark. Verse 10, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer righteousness. There's a true righteousness, a real righteousness that we see in Jesus. It's the only true righteousness. He was the paradigm, the model of right living. And and any paradigm of right living, whether it's the Buddhist community or the trans community or the Charles Schwab community, that's not the righteousness of Jesus, is not true righteousness. And verse 11, concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world will be judged. Satan is the ruler of this world. He has this present world, right? But he is going to be judged. So remember, when you're praying for your unbelieving friends, these are all the things the Spirit is working. These are, these are the things he's doing in the world. He has more to say, but he stops himself in verse 12. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. He's like, I know you're not going to hear me right now because you're sad because I'm going away. So he leaves more work for the Spirit. But what about for believers? What's the Spirit's work in believers? Verse 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, there's another name. He's the helper. He's the Spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. The Spirit's work is to reveal the message of Jesus. The same Jesus they were listening to then would continue to speak through his Spirit. See, sometimes we think 
the ministry of Jesus stopped when he died. No, there's a continuity of the ministry of Jesus that continues today through his spirit. There's no end to that. Just as Jesus revealed God to the world, so the Spirit would reveal Jesus to the world. I've heard people sometimes say, and I think as believers we sometimes think, you know, if I just could have been there, if I could have like heard his tone and seen what his face looked like and maybe watched how he interacted with disciples, then I really could have known him. Then it would have been different. Then I'd really be in. And Jesus is saying, actually, you can. By my spirit, you can know me just like they did. Through my word, the Holy Spirit will dynamically represent me to you, just like I did to them. Do any of you have those those printer scanners at your house? You know what I'm talking about? They're pretty great, right? I didn't know about the DPI. Do you know about the DPI? Okay, see, you all know. I didn't know. It's, it's a, a function of how fast it moves over the page that you're scanning, and it makes it clearer or less clear. And I had many emails coming back like, Chris, I don't know what you're sending me. If you could increase your DPI, well, I had to figure, I had to Google that. <laughs> so I went from 100 to like 600, and suddenly it was much clearer, and everyone could see. Jesus is saying, through the Holy Spirit, you have the highest possible DPI (laughs) of Jesus. You have the highest resolution. You can see him with the clarity that you hope for. This wasn't just true for the first disciples. It's true for us. He takes us by the hand and steps us into the territory of Christ and unfolds his treasures for us. This is why we can trust him. He told the disciples and he tells us that the spirit will reveal even more of me than you can imagine. He'll he'll bring the full revelation of God in Christ. True disciples can learn to hear his voice just as accurately through his word. Do you believe that? You hear him speaking through his word, through the music, through other believers, because he does. That's what he's saying. He, the Spirit, will guide you into all truth. Listen for his voice. Ask for ears to hear. So what's coming? Trouble's coming. Yeah. Help is coming. But glory is coming. That's the third thing. Glory. Look at verse 14. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he, the Spirit, will take what is mine, Jesus, and declare it to you, his disciples. This is like the most succinct job description of the job of the Holy Spirit in the whole Bible. I'm going to take what's Jesus, and he's going to take all of me and show it to you. That's his job. He glorifies Jesus. Now, glory, that's a real Bible-y word, right? In the Hebrew, it's kabod. It means like weightiness or value. For God, it's the beauty of his character. It's the excellence of who he is. The Spirit will honor Jesus because of his beauty. He'll make his greatness, his power, his perfection, his supremacy known to you. He'll take everything of the Father, which belongs to Jesus, and give it to us. The work of the Spirit in our lives is that continuation of Jesus continually revealing God to you. It's the same ministry. His weightiness, his, ver- his worth, his, his value, his beauty is on display. It's like, if you've ever seen at Christmas time, I'm assuming they do it up here. It's all over St. Louis. People will put on the sides of their houses, they'll put some big decoration. Usually it's like a wreath. They'll hang it on the side of their house, and then they have this little light on the ground, and, and they turn it on at night, so what you see is that big wreath with the light on it. You don't really notice the light, but you can clearly see the wreath, right? That's the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is that light that shines on Jesus and makes him clear and bright and enables you to understand his word and know who he is and connect to him. So here's the question. Is this what you look for when you study his word, when you listen for his voice, the glory of Jesus? That's what he's promised, and that's actually what your soul needs. His glory, his beauty, his weight. More than a promise of everything going the way you want, or being safe, or your child getting the job that you hope they do, or your marriage being strong, what you need is the glory of Jesus, that beauty, that surety, that rootedness. Jesus knew what was coming for the disciples, and he knows what's coming for you. Trouble, help, and glory. Because he knows, you can trust him with your tomorrow. Our caseworker warned us about all kinds of things, and she was right. We've had all kinds of things. It's been hard. Trouble has come. Ezra has, I call, the, I call them the ABC diagnoses. He has all the diagnoses, ADD, ODD, autism, cyclical vomiting syndrome, precocious puberty. I mean, I can make you a list. Trouble came. It's true. But so did help. Help by the Spirit. Help from his people. Help from government grants I didn't even know about. All kinds of help came. And glory has come. We've seen God reveal by his Spirit his patience, his kindness, his provision in ways we never would have seen, except for Ezra. As you and your grandchildren live in a more and more post-Christian America, trouble's going to come. For some of you, it maybe already has. There's going to be a cost to following him. But Jesus knows all those things. So trust him. Entrust yourself to him. Trust his help that he has given to you and trust that you will see his glory. Let me pray. Jesus, you are a kind, kind shepherd. You didn't have to give us any of these warnings. You didn't even have to give us your word. And yet in your kindness, you give us all these stories and songs and words that we could actually know you, not as just some concept, but as a person. Thank you for your goodness. Would you continue to remind us that you are, in fact, trustworthy in all of these places that we worry about? Meet us there. Remind us, Holy Spirit, that we are not alone. Thank you for these ladies. Thank you for your gift of faith to each of them. Amen.